My name is Laura Francis Marin. I'm a talent acquisition professional, and I'm next on the Rec Tech Podcast. Welcome to another edition of the Rec Tech Podcast, the recruiting technology show. I'm your host, Chris Russell. I'm a consultant who helps job boards and HR tech vendors with strategy and marketing. So the goal of the show is to highlight interesting recruiting technologies as well as talk to recruiters and how they use technology to recruit. And today we'll be doing just that with a new episode of How I Recruit. But first, the Rec Tech Podcast is sponsored by Jobs to Careers. Jobs to Careers is the leading programmatic marketplace to find talent. Using predictive analytics, the company enables recruiters to estimate the cost and applicant volume they can expect and only pay for completed applications. Jobs to Careers' mission is to innovate the way talent effectively finds work and work finds talent. For more info, go to jobstocareers.com slash employers. Now on to our guest. Laura Francis Marin is a talent acquisition and people operations professional specializing in high-growth startups. She launched her career with Robert Half and recently served as the head of talent for QConnect and these days serves as people operations and recruitment consultant for startups in New York City and Boston. She's passionate about identifying, developing, and coaching sparks of talent, and loves nothing more than helping people map out their next career steps. So I met Laura recently at a small gathering of recruiters in New York City, and when she heard about the podcast, she was eager to talk. So I'm so glad we have her on. Laura, welcome to the show. And thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate this opportunity. It's great to speak with you again. No problem. Love talking to recruiters. Um, I guess let's start out by... Uh, Telling, telling us more about your uh, day-to-day life right now. Um, I guess my first question is, what's a typical day like recruiting for startups in New York City? Sure, it's a great question because it is very different from my previous stint mm-hmm. as an agency recruiter. Yeah. So even more so than usual, or in my you know, previous role, I'm really ruled by my calendar because there are so many moving pieces, um, so many moving parts. And so the day will start, my alarm goes off, and I look at my emails, and I look at my calendar, and I almost instantaneously jump over to the AngelList job app, where I can start, you know, going through different candidates who maybe apply to positions or express interest in the company, or you know, just sort of sift through people who've updated their profile, and sort of creating a, a checklist for myself of people to reach out to. Right. And from there, depending upon which class I am working with the most, where my deadlines are. Um, it, it most often looks like setting expectations of clients and candidates and then jumping into interviews. Gotcha. So I will spend, yeah, usually between like four and six hours a day on interviews. So that's a lot of time, I guess. Definitely. How many uh, recs are you working on at, at once, would you say? Um, anywhere from four to 15. Four to 15, okay. So, yeah. And I assume they run the gamut of tech to marketing and sales and all that kind of stuff? And legal, operations, administrative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's everybody for anything at this point, which is nice. Gotcha. So what's, what's the biggest challenge about recruiting for a startup versus, you know, a typical corporate environment? Or? It's lack of name recognition. Mm-hmm. It's really the most challenging piece is the startups people have heard of that they want to work for, you know, the name brands like Uber um, or HubSpot or things like that, they're already really, really established. And so people want that. They, If they're going to leave a, a corporate environment or a job that they feel is a bit more secure, they want to then move on to a startup that they feel is also secure, which is almost oxymoronic yeah. in a sense. And so especially candidates who are earlier in their career or even later on in their career who are looking for more stability, maybe they have a family or people starting a career, they want to be responsible as they sort of set the path for the rest of their professional life. They want to know that their company is going to be around in, you know, six months, six years, 60 years. So it's convincing candidates of an opportunity beyond just name recognition. Gotcha. So what is your pitch when you first contact a candidate for an unknown startup? And what do you typically try to sell them on? Each pitch is a little bit different. Usually it's tailored to the candidate's specific companies they're with and how long they've been in that role mm-hmm. and perhaps previous positions. LinkedIn is so helpful for this. Um, you know, if they've been with a Q Connect as an e-commerce 
startup. So maybe if they've been with a larger e-commerce site, it was reaching out to candidates and saying, hey, do you want to help build the next big thing in e-commerce? You already learned so much. Are you ready to make a really big mark? And getting people really excited about the idea of being an influencer and having impact in their space. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm curious what your initial outreach is like in terms of, of, of that to you. Like, what would you say to someone over the phone or what would your first email say, uh, for instance? Um, Sometimes I, I, I get a little sneaky <laughs> and I <laughs> pretend good. that I'm calling. Yeah, I get, I get really sneaky and I feel like my thoughts going to get blown up right now. But I do, I'll call people at their desk or I'll shoot a note through LinkedIn or their email and I'll ask for a referral. So my subject line will say networking mm-hmm. for X, Y, and Z. And I will list out the role and say like, hey, like this is a you know, high growth, extraordinarily well-funded startup. You have an opportunity to be one of the founding members of the leadership team. You know, this is our path. This is what we're on track for. Or sorry, not you, but somebody who was ever in this role. Who do you know? who might be a good fit for this position or who'd be excited to learn more. And about 75, 80% of the time that there's a response, mm-hmm. it's that person saying, what about me? <laughs> Do you want to talk to me about it? Nice. So, uh, yeah, that's my, that's my favorite approach. All right, cool. Um, that's, a good, uh, that's a good strategy. Um, so how long have you, uh, in terms of te- technology, Laura, um, how do you keep up with that in terms of, you know, knowing enough to recruit for it? Do you have any uh, tips or tactics you could share with the audience on that? Yes. I did not start tech recruiting until March of this year. And oh, wow. so one of my new. most, yeah. I'm sorry? So you're brand new in tech. I'm brand new in tech, but I also have a certain uh, lack of ego when it comes to recruitment mm-hmm. in that I know that unless I fully understand the role, I can't fill it. So, you know, it's working with the key stakeholders. Uh, as soon as I hired a CTO with QConnect, I, I let him know even during the process, as soon as he was hired, I was like, listen, the vast majority of the hiring we're going to be doing is, is for your team. I need you to teach me. Show me what you need in a partner. And from there, you know, we can get started. But I also was supplementing any of those one-on-one conversations with different thought leadership pieces. Stack Overflow is amazing. I love everything that they put out. I Mm -hmm. follow them on LinkedIn and they have white papers. They have interviews. They have just little bits and pieces that they're easy to read when you're waiting for lunch or if you're waiting at the subway. And that's how I'm continually adding to my knowledge base. And of course, you know, there's a big news story going on. I'll try to research any of those other key factors and technology pieces that are coming up. Sure. Okay. That's good. Um, so LinkedIn, you mentioned AngelList, Stack Overflow, pretty good tools there. Um, mm-hmm. Any other tools as part of your day-to-day recruiting? Do you have any kind of favorites you go to in terms of a, like a Chrome extension or another website? Uh, what else do you use? Yeah, so I, I was really lucky with Q. We um, implemented Greenhouse, which is my favorite ATS in okay. the world. Greenhouse, right. I've only used two. Yeah, I love Greenhouse, but I also had a really unique experience where my CTO was fully on board and in just at all the meetings. So we were building things in real time with our account manager. Mm-hmm. So we had incredibly fast turnaround. So I don't think that was a normal experience. That was really great. Um, I, of course, use labeling like crazy in my Gmail. Spreadsheets are wonderful. Um, but my, my favorite sort of hidden trick is Indeed resume search, which seems really, really archaic, but a lot of times when people are applying quickly, be it from their phone or they're looking for, um, you know, a new opportunity, they go to Indeed because so much of, you know, of the job postings are are pulled together there. And they won't realize that when they're applying through Indeed, there's a question that says, would you like to add your resume to Indeed? And they're just clicking yes, 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 yes. And so then when you apply for a job on Indeed, then most of the time, unless you conscientiously opt out, your resume is there to be searched. And it's great. So that's what I think. And, you can, and if you post jobs on Indeed, you can also track it and you get, you know, an understanding of the metrics behind, you know, your outreach, candidate interest, you know, mm-hmm. all those things. But mm-hmm. That's my favorite hidden trick. All right, cool. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned Greenhouse as your uh, favorite ATS. Do you have a, 
a worst ATS that you've worked with over the years? Anyone come to mind? Um, well, there have only been three ATSs really, truly in my life I've used. There okay. Tell us about them. Was a proprietary, there was a proprietary one at Robert Half that was really, in a lot of ways, wonderful because it had so much information and it was built specific to recruiting and to, you know, all of the, the different tasks and responsibilities you have when you're running a full desk. So when you're doing both recruitment and sales and different coding pieces, but it, at the same time, there were definite flaws that made it difficult, but it was the only system I ever learned how to recruit through. Mm-hmm. So that was my first exposure. So it was the best and the worst of the time. Um, when I joined Q, when I you know, first left this huge, huge company to go to a startup, we were using a color-coded spreadsheet. Which was good to a certain extent, yeah. but it's really easy to get lost. It's really, it's, it's difficult to see what's going on. You, you can't do the same snapshot. One of the things about Greenhouse that I love is that you, have, you can do like a dashboard snapshot of your metrics. Um, you can see, you know, where people are in the candidate feedback loop. You can see where candidates, like how long it's been since you've been in touch with a candidate. You can... Um, you know, send out mass emails, things like that, that you, mm-hmm. you can't automate through a spreadsheet, which we could do a lot of that with Robert Haas, but it was a lot cleaner. In yeah. So the spreadsheet ATS, I wonder how many companies around the, around the world are using that today. <laughs> <laughs> Probably most of them. Probably most of them. Interesting. All right. Hey, what, what was your Robert Haas experience like? How long, how long were you there? And tell me about that quickly, if you could. Yeah, so I was there for about um, just under three years, and it was really incredible. It was unlike anything I'd ever done in my entire life. I think like most people in recruitment, I I fell into recruitment. I didn't mean to be a recruiter. And I just was really, really fortunate to be placed on a team of top, top producers in the company and reporting to somebody who was actually very high up in my division for the entire company, the entire mm-hmm. country, right. who also had just finished a clip of being a national trainer <laughs> for new hires. So I got to sit next to him and learn from him for you know, just about a year. I sat next to him. And I remember saying to him a few weeks in, I was like, so you're going to be my mentor and you're going to teach me everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was really, really lucky to have learned from the most incredible people uh, one of the, the members of my first team at Robert Half had been there longer than I've been alive, like mm. not on that team. Yep. So there's a lot of institutional knowledge that you that you get from people, just being almost like osmosis, people who've been doing this forever that have made a full career out of recruitment. Um, you learn best practices. The One of the things I learned the most from was just, bullpen interactions where if I'd be on a tough call and people would start to like chime in and give me advice or vice versa. You'd hear other people having difficult calls with candidates or clients, whatever's going, you got to learn from just, from more than just your own interactions and, and mistakes, I guess. <laughs> so that yeah. was really wonderful. Yes. And it provided an incredible amount of structure. It's very metrics driven there. And it, it gave me the structure and the tools that I was then able to, to start to implement at Q and that I will carry with me forever. Nice. Of always looking for what, yeah. So that's, I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better place to learn how to recruit. Nice. And, and you need that structure uh, when you're beginning in recruiting because it is such a, you know, nuanced uh, uh, job. It, uh, that's, that's important. So it's great that you had that mentorship. Yeah. Hey, do you, lucky. do you remember your, your first placement? Um, I do. <laughs> Tell us about your first placement. <laughs> I remember. So my first placement was a real estate accountant, uh, um, a real estate property accountant. I don't know if I should say his name, but I still remember his name to this day. Okay. Um, and I did almost everything wrong in the entire <laughs> process. Um, I made my first placement. I was very lucky. I think it was in, within like five weeks of starting. Wow. Like four or five weeks. Nice. So it was really, really quick. Um, it was with a, a member of my team. It was his client. And I, as you can tell, I'm a very enthusiastic, energetic person. This was certainly not missing from my search process when I started in recruiting, Mm -hmm. still the same way today. And I was just voracious. I was reading every resume, posting everywhere, digging through things. And I didn't know how, 
I thought I knew, but I didn't know. So I did things like, you know, I told him the full actual salary range, which was way <laughs> higher than what he was even earning. Um, also much higher than what we could even present him at. Mm-hmm. Um, he also is a very quiet, reserved person. So it was night and day between yeah. the two personalities. For some reason, he trusted me, but I could definitely, like, it was, we never, our phone conversations were always a little awkward. Um, and it was his first major career move. So one of his references, because we always spoke to at least two supervisor references, one of his references was his boss when he was a lifeguard at the Y. So it was just like a very... <laughs> It, was, it felt almost like hyperbolic in terms of just how ridiculous in a way it was. Yeah. But it was incredibly rewarding. And one of my colleagues who'd been with Robert Half for, I think, like seven or eight years at that point, it was his client. He was able to coach me through things. His personality matched the candidates a lot better. So that, I'm sure, helped a lot. And he stayed there for, I want to say, at least like two years. So it was, it was quality hire. really rewarding. And yeah. I, yeah, it was a quality hire. And I, and I learned a lot. From, from the whole process. So um, it was exciting. Do you remember where you found him? Like, were you... Uh... I think I found him on Career Builder. Career Builder or Monster. Gotcha. Okay. All right. How about your last placement, Laura? What, um, where did you find that person? Um, tell, us the, tell us a quick story around that. So the, my most recent placement was just... She just accepted, I think it was like last Friday, which was really exciting. Um, and she is working now where she's about to start working for a uh, commercial real estate development company, it's like a startup company in the city. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, pretty good size, about 150 people. And it's a really interesting role where she's going to be supporting both the general counsel and the operations team the end doing contracts. So it was a very interesting position where we needed somebody who had a background in Real estate, also in like, you know, support experience, senior leadership support, someone who's very composed, someone who had the aptitude and capacity to to really grow in this department because the general counsel made it very clear. He's like, I want to coach this person and train them to, to really excel wherever they go in the company or in their career. And that's an opportunity when you're just like, I love this client mm-hmm. and I want to make sure it's a perfect hire mm-hmm. and I want to take advantage of that. So for her, I believe I found her through Monster or or Career, bu- career Builder. Um, and it was one of those things where you go back, you keep looking at the resume, and mm-hmm. you're not sure why you're looking at it. And you have this, like, I got to call them. But like, they, don't, they don't match everything on paper, but I feel like I have to call them. And it's just, it was perfect. It was a seamless process. And and she was so thrilled. We were so thrilled to get everything put together. And so that was nice. another wonderful experience. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. How much uh, co-calling do you do? These days, not as much because I'm trying to pull for the most part out of other startups. Mm-hmm. And most startups, if there is a main phone line, it's just going to, you know, it's, often not answered or if it is it's like going to the sales team or it, there isn't really any privacy I see um, I used I used to do about I kid you not 100 calls a day that's the Robert Half metric yeah <laughs> um, and it is and it's something that sticks with you it really does so yeah, that's um, good training you know if you're that. yeah that's good training for a new a, a new person in recruiting I mean just dialing for for uh, contacts you know it's it's uh, that's where you, you, you test your metal and it's where you learn yeah, I mean, dialing for dollars, smiling and dialing, whatever you want to call it, being really comfortable with the sound of your voice and, and asking people for things and, and pivoting on the fly. When you do that 100 times a day, even if it's just leaving a voicemail, you're going to get a lot better, a lot faster than you would anticipate. Yeah. So now the cold calling will happen if, if I make contact with the candidate initially through LinkedIn. And things are it's more of a warm call, but if you know things start to pitter patter, and and it's not as consistent as I would like in terms of email or, or messaging communication, I'll call them. Um, and that's and and another mm. cold calling trick. I don't know if it'd be helpful for your audience, but I used to do when it was when I was calling into a larger company, um, 
is, and, and the person's extension wasn't listed, is mm-hmm. I would call the wrong department on purpose. Yeah. And I would say, like, oh, like, this is, a, like, like, oh, hi, can, may I can speak with Chris? And they'd be like, this is a, like, who are you talking about? This is a marketing department. Oh, I was hoping to speak with Chris in talent acquisition. I must have dialed the wrong thing. Would it be possible for you to connect me, please? <laughs> and more often than not, they will switch you right over. Yep. And so that's, uh, that's one of my favorite cold calling tactics. Awesome. That's uh, good stuff, Laura. Good stuff. <laughs> so uh, of all the people over the years you've placed, which one was the most satisfying to you and why? The most, that, I mean, I've had a couple up there, but in terms of, on the whole, the most satisfying position in person that's ever been placed was David Gitman, the CTO that I hired for Q Connect. CTO, he, okay. It, yeah, he's an incredibly accomplished e-commerce, you know, legend in the sense. Mm-hmm. Um, it, he's, he was like the first senior engineer at eBay or something like that. He like established e-commerce or Twitter us. So being in the e-commerce space, you want somebody who who really knows their stuff, but also has that, you know, it's a tentpole hire, right? Like you want somebody who can also have that attraction, that passive recruitment attraction with them. Right. And everything about hiring David, just, it, it was amazing. It was, um, I, I will, I will confess now he's one of my, my, my closest mentors. So mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons I'm, you know, gushing even more so, <laughs> but he just reaffirmed all of the theories and beliefs that I had about recruitment. And I'd never really done tech hiring. I closed two other tech candidates for Q Connect about a week or two prior mm-hmm. starting the interview process with him. But this was, you know, this is a big position and my first like major from start to finish tech hire. And um, it's just everything about, like, I, I believe firmly that you need to know your candidates on, like, a human level mm-hmm. in order to be able to close them and to, in order to be able to make sure they're the right person for the fit for the role, the right fit for your team. Um, also, you you know, I look at recruitment as more than just talent acquisition. It's also coaching people and getting them ready to to hit the ground running when they join your team to also position them to advance themselves in their career. So you get to know someone really well, you're able to provide feedback from the get-go. Um, also, he just, you know, well, you're also, you're always closing from the beginning. You want to know if, like, you have that shot of closing them. But so with David, I did everything I'd ever done with a candidate that I thought may be a little risky, but it always paid off. So, for instance, one of my favorite things to ask candidates is, during the day, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Is it calling, email, or text? And if it's email or text, it's that phone number, which is that email that you're working, whatever it is. And staying in constant contact, especially, you know, as they're, they're narrowing down the, you know, their, their decision-making process and choosing between different offers. He was between two other offers and ours mm-hmm. and got down to a point where I, he was about to, um, he had something that was a very promising opportunity that was based in Australia and I knew that if he got on the plane to go to Australia, I would never be able to hire him. And I remember throwing myself, barricading myself into a phone booth at WeWork and being like, all right, let's just do this. Let's just figure out what makes David Gitman tick, <laughs> even more so than I thought I knew before. And let's, let's do this. Let's play devil's advocate. And so I went through both opportunities with him. I treated him like a human because he is a human. Um, I think that that may have been part of what resonated as well. It wasn't mm-hmm. just a hire. I was like, you're gonna you're you're gonna be my colleague and my person I'm speaking to for eighty hours a week. Like this is a big deal for me as well. Yep. Um, and I got to learn all about him and the, when his offer was coming in because we also you know it's the other tough thing with a startup and a smaller startup is again going back to you know less brand name recognition you have also means a less dollars there are to put toward offers and compensation packages. So you're really, you have to sell the opportunity more than just this is what your paycheck's going to look like. And so working with him, never losing contact with him, being constantly texting the night his offer was supposed to come in. Um, I think our CEO was traveling. Um, it was just like one of those things I was texting with him and I was like, listen, it's eight o'clock now. I got to go home. I got to walk my dog. <laughs> um, but I'll be in touch with you. You will know what happens before, like, you will not go to bed tonight without hearing from me. What's the latest I can call you or text you? He's like, it's me at 11 o'clock. 
then he asked him what kind of dog I have. So I'm like sending him pictures of my dog, and I'm like, this is either going to be really weird or a great That's a, that's story a good closing uh, tip there. <laughs> No, I like that, Laura. I mean, uh, I think you said it best when you said, uh, in order to close the candle, you have to know them on a human level. And I, I couldn't agree more with that. So uh, kudos to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So essentially that's, um, you know, and, and the, the cherry on top is sometimes when I travel, you know, David and his family will watch my dog. So, oh, nice. it's, you know, really came full circle for me. So that, that's the most rewarding hire. It doesn't career. get better than that. doesn't get better than that. No. Awesome. All right, Laura. Laura, we certainly appreciate your advice, Laura. Last question for you. Uh, if you're talking to someone coming out of school today who wants to be a recruiter, what's your advice to them? Is find a mentor. Um, obviously, I benefited a lot. Oh, I guess I have two pieces of advice. The first okay. one is find a mentor. And then the next piece is to actually implement the advice I give you. <laughs> and to, to understand that there's a method to the madness, you're going to feel like you get kicked in the face a lot of the time, but that you have the greatest <clears throat> job in the world which is helping individuals advance their careers while helping companies advance their goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. And so you get to, you get to change people's lives and you get to do it for, for a living. You get paid to do it. Um, so don't, don't forget that either throughout well, the process. Awesome. Well, Laura Francis Marin, thanks for joining me today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. This was lovely. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Where can people learn more about you? Do you have a website or Twitter account or? My, the best way to get in touch with me would be LinkedIn, which is linkedin.com slash in slash Laura Francis, which is L-A-U-R-A-F-R-A-N-C-E-S. All right. And we'll link to you, your bio in the, uh, in the show notes too. So Laura, thanks again. Thank you, Chris. Have a great day. That will do it for this edition of the Erect Tech Podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Chris Russell or visit erecttechmedia.com where you can find the audio and links for this show on our blog. Also note, we are now on iTunes and Google Play, so subscribe to get those episodes on your device of choice. Thanks for listening, everyone.